I think last time you were here, we didn't have Wendy, so it was half as good. But uh, <laughs> ah, last year, there we go. But great to have you guys here. Uh, Terry and Wendy are a, a big friends to this community, been with us, I don't know, the last four or five years. Uh, every year, we've been blessed to have these guys. And so let's open our hearts wide to what God uh, wants to say uh, through Terry and through his word. Over to you, buddy. Be with you again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I do pray I can be a blessing to you in the Word. And, uh, oh, little step for me. How kind. <laughs> Is this on? Are we okay? Good. I want to speak to you from uh, John's Gospel in chapter 2. Okay, John and chapter 2. Are we on or not? Sounds a little quiet. Okay. Oh, there we go. I've landed. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a joy to see you all. Thank you for this opportunity to fellowship. I want to read to you from a famous story in John's Gospel and chapter 2. And uh, it's a familiar story. It's the very first sign which Jesus did. And uh, you'd expect Jesus to do a sign maybe in the synagogue or maybe the temple. And it's an unexpected first demonstration of his wonderful commitment to the human race, actually, to his people, how he came into a context of actual disaster, really, and turned it upside down. And it's great to know a God who will do that for us. So we're going to read in John 2. I'll read the first, uh, I think, about 11 verses. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour hasn't yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots sat there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now. Take to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you've kept the good wine till now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Father, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the joy of singing your praise the testimonies we've heard, the words that have been impressed upon, different ones. We, we celebrate the wonder of being in your presence. And Lord, we ask right now, Holy Spirit, would you come? Rest upon us. Be our teacher. Open our hearts to hear you. Come, Holy Spirit, transform us by your truth, by your presence. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm reminded of uh, an occasion when uh, one of the elders of the church, which I've spent most of my life in, he turned up one Sunday morning, as usual, and uh, he wasn't preaching that morning. He was just there with his family. Uh, it's quite a team of elders, preaching elders. And uh, he, he took his seat and, uh, with his family there. And he opened the bulletin. We used to have a bulletin every week. You just pick up the bulletin, see what's happening this week. And his name was Steve Horn. And he picked up the bulletin and looked, hmm, this is interesting, interesting. Turned over the page uh, and read, this morning, Steve Horn is preaching at Heathfield Church. And... <laughs> He said a very swift goodbye to his wife and children, <laughs> ran out of the church, got in his car, and drove the 20 miles 
to Heathfield. And he said it got there just in time. <laughs> I remember once I was speaking at our Stonely Bible Week, which grew and grew and grew over the years. The last year was 30,000 people camping over two weeks, 15,000 each week. It had grown and grown and grown. Great celebration, people in caravans and tents, church groups all over these fields, great big tent in the middle. And uh, I was doing a series of preaching in the evenings, and I came to the second one of that series, and we've just been having our wonderful worship, tremendous praise, and it's a great privilege to stand on the platform and look at these thousands of people, and, uh, and then there were the kind of notices and things, you know, the inevitable notices, and, and I, I went back to the back of this quite large platform and sat down and thought, I'll just have a last look at my notes before I preach. I sat, opened my Bible, and there was last night's notes, <laughs> yes, yesterday's notes. And I thought, I looked at this crowd, I thought, oh, wow, what do I do? And I thought, well, there's no choice, you know, no, and, and, and that, the notices were being given. And I thought, well, I just kind of went off the platform <laughs> and got down, and I ran all the way up to this place where we were staying, and found my notes, ran all the way back. And thankfully, there was an item which I'd completely forgotten. We didn't usually have items, but there was an item, and it was still happening when I got back. Thank you, Lord. And I slipped up to the, you know, all's well, really, yeah, no panic. <gasps> And the people outside were saying, what's Terry Virgo running up there for? <laughs> Why do I tell these silly stories? Well, here in our Bibles, we have a... If I was going to... I don't often give my sermons a title, but if I were, the, the embarrassment of inadequacy. The embarrassment of inadequacy. They're at this wedding, and they've run out of wine. And I, I think that... In those days, Cana, we've had the privilege of being to Israel. We went to Cana. It's a bustling little town now. But then it would have been a tiny village. And probably that wedding would have been the big item maybe of the year. And I guess most of the people of the village would have been invited. And it's going to be the wedding that is remembered because the, the wedding, full of shame, they ran out of wine. You remember that wedding? Oh, what a disaster. What a hopeless situation. And so this, this story this morning is for people who are in fear of running out. They're not quite sure if they're going to make it. The embarrassment of what at the moment may be hidden becoming public. I'm running out. Maybe running out of energy, running out of hopes, running out of money. Running out of any kind of time, Peace of mind, running out, it's running out. No one knows at the moment. It's just something you're living with. You're in trouble. In this story, someone's in trouble. And they, they just speak to Mary because it's just a private problem at the moment. And maybe, maybe you've spoken to one person. You're in trouble, but nobody knows yet. And, and this first sign, that's an amazing miracle of how Jesus comes to people who are running out. Maybe you thought, I'll go to church once more. Maybe you thought, no, I'll just go once more. Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you think, I'll go to church, see what this, is there any hope for me? The Bible is full of hope. It's a book of hope. It's a book of wonderful deliverance. And it's not just uh, religious, it's about real life where you feel maybe you're on the edge and wondering how much longer you can go. That's what this is about. It's about people not sure whether they're going to cope or not and how Jesus incredibly answers their need. In fact, it's interesting when John sums up his gospel at the end in John chapter 20, he said Jesus did many signs. He records why he wrote it. He says in verse 30 of chapter 20, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's what, he said, that's why I wrote this. 
Uh, he did many, many signs. This is the first of his signs. In fact, in John's Gospel, seven of Jesus' miracles are called signs. He did many, many miracles. John calls seven of them signs because they're pointing somewhere. They're telling us something. It's not just that he did this miracle. There's purpose behind it. It's giving us an indication. It's showing us something. This is the very first one, the first sign. And he wrote it that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that when you believe that, something happens. It's not just believing that Julius Caesar lived. It's li when you believe about Jesus, something happens in your heart. Your life gets changed. Situation is transformed because of this belief we have in Jesus. I'm so grateful someone told me about Jesus. My parents were not Christians until very late in life. I had no knowledge there was a God. And then I heard about Jesus. I thought, oh, why didn't someone tell me this ages ago? You can hear about him. When you hear, things change. And that's why John wrote. He wrote it so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's why this is recorded. So let's just remind ourselves the setting. It's a wedding. And you know, the commentators tell us this. These wedding parties could last up to seven days. I mean, they knew how to party. <laughs> seven days of celebration, often, when they had these events. And Jesus was invited. Now it's good to know that Jesus was happy to come to a party. That's what, what, what we learn from this story. First thing we learn is Jesus is happy to be at a party. I hope your Jesus, in your mind, is happy to be at a party. Sometimes Jesus, we think he's in church and we visit him once a week. Uh, you know, he may be in the synagogue, he may be at the temple, but here, this very first introduction to Jesus, this first demonstration of who he is, is happens at a party. It's kind of crazy. What, why not in a synagogue? Why not in a temple? No, this first sign is at a party. So that's opening my eyes a bit to Jesus wants to be in our lives. He doesn't want to just be here on Sunday morning. He wants to be in our lives. He's happy to be at a party. He's happy to be at an event that wasn't about him. It was about another couple. You know what weddings are like. All eyes are on the couple, the bride. And Jesus is happy to be at a place where he's not the center of attention. He's happy to be there. He's happy to join in. He's happy to be in a community. And it's so important, beloved, that we don't think of Jesus as this religious figure that you have to be in a particular religious mode to encounter with. He came into our world, into our life. He made life like it is. He made community. He made family. And when he came, he said, I've come that you might have life. Not that you might have meetings and have them more abundantly. <laughs> but I want to come into your life. I, I just want to share with you. I want to be part of it. And, and many, many stories in the Gospels about him eating with people. And sometimes it seems with the wrong people. He loved just being in their lives. Jesus wants to be in your life, at your parties. That's the Jesus that the Bible tells us about. He's not painted in the window, in colored windows. He's with us. That's the first thing I see here. Jesus is happy to be there at a party. He's also happy, let's notice this. He's happy to be at a wedding. In fact, often if you attend maybe a formal wedding, you'll hear the preacher quote something which says, something like this, Jesus by his presence at the wedding of Cana, endorsed marriage. Now, sadly, in our generation, it's worth spending a moment to say that. Jesus is for marriage. It was uh, recorded last year in England. More babies were born in England last year outside of marriage than inside. More children born outside of marriage than inside. And people are kind of giving up on getting married. It's going out of fashion. It's like the girl hears the God boy say to him, would you like to? And she thinks, ah, move in with me. Oh, it's not, he's not keen on commitment. Commitment's going out of fashion. Try it, taste and see, and walk away is more in the mode. But Jesus is for marriage. He is for marriage. The Bible starts, if you like, with a marriage. 
And it says right there, back in Genesis 3, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they should become one flesh. That's there in the Bible. God loves marriage. God is for marriage. He's not for experimentation. He's for commitment. And we're scared of commitment in the natural, but when you become a Christian and know something about God, you understand he loves commitment. He loves covenant love. The Bible's about covenant love. It's about his loving us. And marriage is a kind of reflection of that. And Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 5 about our marriage as being like the marriage of Christ to his people. And when John the Baptist first came on the scene, he's the herald of the coming of Christ. He's the first voice in the wilderness. Get ready, get ready. And say, are you the Christ? He said, no, 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 no. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. What an introduction to Jesus. I'm the one getting people ready for him. For who? The bridegroom. I'm his friend. I'm like the best man. We're talking about a wedding. And if you look at the end of your book, you see at the beginning that marriage is mentioned. Then at the very end, what's the last thing in the book? The marriage supper of the Lamb. The joining of God to his people forever. Jesus is for marriage. Let's be clear about it. A man and a woman joined together. He's for it. In covenant commitment, forsaking all others, I give myself to you. We need to display that, declare that, live that out in the grace of God, enjoy the wonder of it. That's what this story is telling me. Jesus is happy to be at a wedding. He's happy to be at a party. He's happy to share our lives with us, to come right into our marriages, to be central in our marriages, to be dependent upon in our marriage. So here we see Jesus saying that, making that very clear by his presence at a wedding. Now in that context, we get the strange situation. They're running out. Just come back to that theme. Just feeling, I'm not sure I'm gonna make it. I'm running out of gas, will we get there? Are we gonna make? It's frightening, isn't it? If you're on a long, long journey in the open country and you look at your tank, you think, wow, I don't know if we're gonna make it. You can get that in life. Are we going to make it? And and we find that Mary talks to Jesus. Someone has shared with Mary. Someone's confidence. We're not telling the whole party. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. It's great to be here this morning. Maybe just to one friend who said, I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm I'm running out. And Mary comes to Jesus and, and says, hey, they're out of wine. And Jesus says, woman, beg pardon, woman? I never said that to my mother, woman. (laughs) Now now you'll find if you use the NIV, popular translation, it says, dear woman. I I give you permission to take your biro and cross out dear. It's not in the Greek, it just isn't there. And so the translators have thought, hmm, woman sounds a bit, they put dear in. (laughs) It's not there. It's just woman. Now, I don't want to overstate it because from the cross, when Jesus is dying, you think, how did he have time to think about anybody else? He looks down on Mary and says, woman, behold your son. And there's John standing with her. This is John, behold your mother. So he says, woman there. So don't want to overstate it, but I've never said to my mother, woman. It's a funny answer. And if that's not funny, if that's... See, D.A. Carson, the famous theologian, says the expression is at least a measured rebuke. And then he says this. Actually, what have I got to do with you? Now, that's in the the Bible. It's got... In your translations, you'll find again... There's so many different translations these days. It's translated differently sometimes. Literally... If you translate it word for word from the Greek, what to me and to you. That's the literal translation of each word. What to me and to you. Now, it's a phrase that you'll be familiar with if you know the Gospels because it comes up in other, other settings. And the way it's translated is this. What have I got to do with you? You think, when have I heard that before? Where have I heard that? Yeah, it's in the Gospels. What have I got to do with you? Remember where it comes? It comes in a few places. Maybe one of the most famous is when Jesus crosses the lake and there's a guy who calls himself Legion. 
because he's full of demons. And no one can tie him down. He, they chain him up and he breaks the chains. And Jesus comes to this demonic guy. And he, he walks to him and the demonic guy says to Jesus, What have I got to do with you? It's like, you are other, you are different. What, what have I got to do with you? That's what Jesus said. I don't think he said like that to his mother. What have I got to do with you? <laughs> All right. But that's what, that's what Legion said to him. It's like, who are, we are other. He said, why is he saying this to his mother? This is weird. What have I got to do with you? Why this confrontation? Why this strange conversation? Well, let's back up a bit and think what's happening at this party. Jesus has grown up in the home of Mary and Joseph. He's been a perfect son. It says when he was a little boy of 12 that they made their journey back away from Jerusalem, having gone up to the feast, and when they went on their way home, they suddenly realized after a few days hey, he's not in the extended family. They thought, oh, he's with the extended family on this long journey. And then, where's Jesus? He's not here. And they, and they rush back. And there he is talking with the rabbis. You remember that story? And it says he went with them and was obedient to them. He was a perfect child. And then he grew up and was a perfect teenager. Let's think for just think a minute. Oh. Perfect teenager. All right. He was, he was perfect. And, and Mary's used to having this wonderful person in her home. And then if you read the Gospels, I mean, Joseph kind of isn't there later on. It's Mary and the other children. There were other children in the family, but Joseph, it seems to have disappeared. And, and, and most... Academics would say, well, probably Joseph died young. And in a home of several sons and daughters, I'm sure Jesus, as it were, the oldest son in the home, would have been a rock for Mary. I can't imagine anything different. He would have been kind, thoughtful, just there for her. I'm sure she got used to looking to Jesus, finding him to be what she needed in terms of things that had to happen, taking the strain, being a loving, a loving, loving son, surely. And that's her background, that's her experience of him. And now, now we're at this wedding, and it's the first sign, and Jesus has gone public. He's been baptized, and at his baptism, the voice comes from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm delighted. God, God speaks. God owns him. And the Spirit comes on him visibly. John the Baptist said, when I, I told when I, the one on whom I see the Spirit come, he's the one. And the Spirit comes up, this is the one. He started his messianic life and ministry. And he's gathered a few disciples. The thing has started. This is the beginning of the church. We find Andrew, Peter, John, James, the, the disciple, Jesus, it says plainly, he's come to this wedding. He's, it's like a family occasion. Don't forget the wedding. I guess you've got some of those in your diary. Don't forget the wedding. Someone said to you, hey, don't forget that. Oh, yeah, we'll be, there. We'll be at the wedding. It's a social occasion at this village. Jesus is part of that social world, and he's invited to the wedding. But he's got some disciples with him. In other words, there's an overlap. At this wedding of Cana, there's an overlap of Jesus' humanity, family life, context with Mary, and his beginning to be the messianic king, the savior of the world. And this crisis of running out of wine is hitting an overlap moment. And in that moment, Mary has to learn something pretty significant. I'm not here any longer just for you. That's what she has to learn. Things have changed, Mary. You need to understand it's a new day. I've been available. I've been a loving son. I'm sure he always would be. But a new day has started. And D.A. Carson says, we must not avoid the conclusion that Jesus, by rebuking his mother, 
however courteously, declares that at the beginning of his ministry, his utter freedom from any kind of human advice, agenda, or manipulation. He is declaring at the beginning of his ministry his utter freedom from any kind of human advice, agenda, or manipulation. It helps us to see how, we've to see how we have to see Jesus. You see, some of us, we tend to think, well, Jesus is there for me. That's what it's all about. He's there for me. And sometimes you, you can meet someone and they, and they don't come to church anymore. And you maybe go after them and say, what happened? They say, oh, he didn't do anything for me. I tried it. He didn't do anything for me. It's like, it's like the story's about me and Jesus is there for me. It's almost like, you know, he's like the genie in the lamp. It's like, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Jesus, would you do this for me? He's there for me. Parking space, please, Lord. Thank you. It's, <laughs> he's, he's kind of there for me. I still do that, but he's there for me. <laughs> he's generous, all right? But it's important that we don't think that's what it's all about. And we can reduce this incredible kindness of God to where well, he sort out your problems. That's the deal. You've got your life, you know, you've got your family, you've got your responsibilities, you've got your job, you've got your career, and you've got Jesus too. It's pretty helpful. And that is not what it's all about. It's not that he's on the edge. He's, he's going to introduce something completely different. He is not there just for you, just for me, not just for Mary. Mary has to learn. It, it, if it seems like a kind of challenge. It's like, Mary, you've got to learn. It's not like that anymore. I can't just be living simply for you. At one time, it says Jesus was preaching, and Mary and his brothers come to try and save him, because they think, why is this going nonstop, nonstop, nonstop? And they say to him, Jesus, your mother, your brothers are outside. Like they're concerned for you. And he said, who are my brothers? And who are, who are my, my mother and my brothers? You who do the will of God. It's like, it's a new day dawning, new priorities, new center of gravity, new kingdom, new king. Line up. You've got to line up in a new way. Line up in a new way. That's what's happening here. You say, well, doesn't Jesus care? Isn't he going to solve their problem? It actually solves their problem amazingly. Amazingly. He solves their problem beyond their wildest dreams. I mean, gallons, gallons of the best wine they've ever tasted. The wedding of Cana is not famous because it was a disaster. We ran out. It's famous because of the abundance of magnificent wine. Yeah, he will help. But let's notice how he helps. And let's notice how Mary, how well Mary did. Mary bounces back. And she says, whatever he says to you, do it. That's pretty good, eh? When you've got, you know, what have you got to do with me? She did brilliantly. Whatever he says to you, do it. You know, that's, that's almost a summary of what it is to be a Christian. It's not the whole thing, but it's a massive part of it. Is that what would characterize your Christian life? Is that it? Is that, are you a Christian? Yeah, whatever he says to me, I'll do. No, I'm a Christian. I go to that place on Sunday mornings. I mean, he's there sometimes. No, no, no. This is the key. Whatever he says to you, do it. That's what comes out of the story. And so Jesus gives instructions. He kind of, how does he solve the problem? This is how he solves it. He takes over. See, I, I tried to be a Christian for quite a while. I was, you know, I, I, God, get me out of this trouble. I wasn't obeying him. I wasn't living for him. But I was often in a mess. Mostly because I was being disobedient. And the times I most fervently prayed was, get me out of this. Please solve this. I'm in a real mess here. Get me out of this. I used to pray that. It's about the only thing I did pray. Get me out of this. Get me through this. And then one day I'm in church, ever so backslidden, and God preached on this verse, you did run well, 
Who has hindered you that you no longer obey the truth? You did, blah, blah. When I, when I first heard the gospel, I was 16, I thought, wow, why haven't I ever, I've never heard that before. I can know my sins are forgiven, that Jesus is really alive. And I can know I'm going to heaven. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I didn't, I didn't know anybody believed that. This is wonderful. I was thrilled. And when, when I first heard, I was so thrilled. But then my old lifestyle, it was hard to walk away from it. So I was always in church on Sunday. But I was over kinds of other places the rest of the time. I was living a double life, really. And on this day, you, you did run well. Who has hindered you? And I felt God said this to me. I want your life. I want it now. And I won't speak to you about this again. And that really scared me. I won't speak to you about this again. Because I'd often been convicted of sin. I've been a Christian for about six years, five years maybe. And I'd often been, I felt convicted when the pastor preached. And I might reform for a few days. But then I want your life, I want it now. And I won't speak to you about this again. That scared me, that God might not speak to me again. I thought, where will I finish up? Where will I, I want, I, I want your life. This is a different deal, I never, I never thought of that before. I've got Jesus, he wants my life. He wants to take over. You see, this, this is how he solved this problem. He gave instructions that were specific, unreasonable, and required faith and obedience. That's how he solved the problem. He gave instructions that were specific. Fill the water pots that were unreasonable and required faith. Hey, that, that, that is the key. Jesus is Lord. He gives instructions that are specific. Unreasonable. If I do that, what will happen to my job? If I do that, what will happen to this? If I do that, what? Unreasonable. And require faith and obedience. He takes over. It's not that he's a hard taskmaster. He invites you into a supernatural experience. Fill the water pots. It's crazy. Crazy. It's like, fill the water pots. I don't understand what you mean. Which part of fill the water pots don't you understand? Couldn't be clearer. Fill the water pots. I don't understand. Fill the water pots. That's what Christianity is like. I don't understand. No, of course you understand. But I don't understand the implications. You don't have to. You do what you're told. And you break into another world where Jesus is Lord and suddenly it's his responsibility. Suddenly he's in charge and so the problems are his problems. During the lockdown, I wrote a book on Moses. I so enjoyed it. I enjoyed getting into the life of Moses so much. It's like when Moses is obeying God and he comes to the Red Sea, you know, they're on their journey I've just done what God told me to do. I come on a journey, I come to the Red Sea. Uh, hey, Lord, Red Sea. I got here by obeying God. That's what life is like when you're obeying God. You come to a challenge and you say, hey, Lord. What? You see, if I wandered off, if God had said, go this way, and I thought, no, I've got to go that way, then that's your problem. If you choose to go this way, it's your problem. If you went this way because God told you to, it's his problem. That's what the Bible's all about. From Abraham on. When God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him up. Okay, here goes. He's drawn the knife, but all the promises are in this one. God said, through this son, you're gonna have a, you're, I'm going to have a huge family. I'm get, I, my Lord, God steps in. Beloved, when we're walking with God, doing it God's way, you get God's resources. Yeah. If we're doing it our way, oh, I struggle with faith. That's what we hear, I struggle with faith. 
Why do we struggle with faith? Because we struggle with obedience. We do it our way, and then we expect God to do something. And he doesn't do it. But when, when he has said, fill the water pots, and we do it, it's his responsibility. See, we tend to argue with God. It's, it's clear, fill the water pots. It's like, I can imagine them saying, Lord, they're out of wine. Okay, fill the water pots. Uh, no, you're not listening. There's nothing wrong with the water. We've got plenty of water. It's wine. We're out of wine. Fill the water pots. No, listen, Lord. Listen. We've got plenty of water. It's wine we're out of. Fill the water pots. I don't understand. You don't have to understand. Do it. And, and these guys who followed Jesus, the first sign he did, after a while, they learn to live his way. They become believers. That's what characterized, that's what they're called. They're called believers. The word Christian only appears three times in the New Testament. Only three times. They're believers. So Jesus says, we're going up to the Passover. Go up and you'll see a guy carrying something on his head. Follow him and say, uh, is the room ready? Well, guys don't carry things. Women carry things on their head. No, you follow the guy. So they see the guy, they follow him and say, is the room ready? Yeah, here's the room. Oh, like he said. Like he said. And I need a donkey. Go and you'll find a donkey. And if anybody sees you taking the donkey, say to them, the Lord has need of it. Oh, we go, we go, oh, here's the donkey. What are you doing? Oh, the Lord has need of it. Oh, okay. They learn. We get, we've been fishing all night. We caught nothing. Throw the net the other side. Oh, come on. Throw the net the other side. Wow, we can't contain it. You see, faith and obedience go together. Faith without obedience. You say, oh, I don't have much faith. When we know we've done what God told us to do. When we know that, yeah, he's Lord. When we know that, it's not, he's there for me. He's not some genie getting me out of trouble. Mary, you've got to learn it's a new day. He, he calls the tune. When he calls the tune, he provides the answers. I wonder if it's like that for you yet. I know I, I was a Christian for about five years. I think I, I could say I was born again. I know I was born again. I never knew there was a gospel. And, and, and the night I heard it, I knelt down and I asked Christ to forgive my sin and come into my, and I, my life. And I felt it happen. I thought, my gosh, this is real. But it looks like five years later when I said, Lord, okay, whatever, whatever. I lost all my friends. I went through a very difficult time. But whatever, you're in charge now. My unsaved parents said, what's going on with you? You're going so religious. You're losing all your friends. And it was tough. But Jesus is in charge now. It, it was like a different, different experience altogether. Have you done that yet? Let me ask you this morning. Have you done that yet? Have you said, Lord, you be in charge? You make the calls. You tell me what to do. You tell me where to live. You tell me which job to pursue. You tell me life. He, he wants to enrich. He wants to enrich. He doesn't want to steal. He wants to give you gallons of wine. That's his style. His style isn't narrow. His style is, I'm happy to be at a party. His style is, I know it's not my party, it's their party. I'm happy to be here. This is great. And I've seen, I've seen pictures of Jewish weddings, haven't you? I've seen them all dancing, these guys all dancing. I'm sure Jesus wouldn't be a wallflower. I'm sure he'd have been in there. He's happy to be, he wants to be part of it. He, he wants to supply, he wants to provide. He doesn't want them embarrassed. He doesn't want them to think, oh, the shame, the shame. He doesn't want you ashamed. He doesn't want you to live with shame. Ah, oh, it all went wrong. 
He wants to bless you. But this is the way he does it. He does it by taking over. And then he blesses you. I can't thank God enough for rescuing me from my stupid lifestyle. And I, and I thought, okay, Lord, from now on, whatever you say. It was a radical change. The, the person who led me to the Lord said, perhaps that's when you were saved. No, I, know I, was, I knew I was saved. I knew it because I felt bad most of the time. I'm living wrong. But now, Lord, your way. I'll do it your way. This is the first sign that he did, it says. And it says this, his disciples saw his glory. His disciples saw his glory. And maybe you're not yet a Christian. You're ever so welcome here, as Don has made it clear. You're ever so welcome. You might have seen some people, maybe your neighbors, and you think, how come you're so peaceful? I'd love, I'd love the peace. You've got peace. I'd love the peace you've got. Can I, can I have your peace? Uh, yeah, well, I just want to talk to you about the cross of Jesus. Oh, no, don't, don't know about that Jesus stuff. Don't know about that cross stuff. Oh, it's peace I want. It's like, <laughs> it's not water I want, it's wine. No, no, take the wine, water. Come, come and see Jesus. Jesus is the answer. But I want peace. No, he is the Prince of Peace. I'm full of anxiety. He can take that away. He can give you joy that you never believed possible. He can do all those things. But I, can I have it without him? No, not really. You have to come his way. And he will give. He'll give you more than you could ever have asked for. The best wine you've ever tasted. That's what he wants to give. But whatever he says to you, that's Christianity. That is Christianity. Jesus is Lord. He takes the initiatives. He gives the instructions. And we get on board. And we find, I'm amazed. I am amazed what God has done for my life. Amazed what he's done for me. Absolutely amazed. He's so kind. But he is in charge. Can we close to pray, please? Just bow our heads in prayer. I want to invite you this morning. If you say, I, I, think I, I think I'm in danger of running out. Things are not going well. When you come to Jesus, I'm asking you, have you done it yet? Have you said, whatever you say, Lord? Why don't, why don't you make this this morning? The morning that you made that transition happened for me one day in church, one Sunday morning, I said yes, and everything changed. It was quite tough at first, but it was a doorway to a completely new life. If, if you've not made this step yet, I want to ask you right now, would you just talk to him? Just draw near to Jesus. Say, Lord, I'd love to know you like this. I'd love my problems to be your problems because I know you can handle them. You can open up the mighty Red Sea. You can remove obstacles. You can do all sorts of stuff that I can't do. I'd love to live with you like that. But at the moment, I'm in charge. Will you come and be in charge? Would you do that now? Would you just say something like that to God? Say, Lord, please be in charge. Help me that whatever you say to me, I'll do it. Help me, Lord. You know I'm weak. But help me, because that's what I want. I want the whole deal. I don't want half Christianity. 
of just knowing you're there. I want you in a new way. Just pray it. Just ask him. I'd love, I'd love to pray for you too. I'd just like to kind of seal that prayer in your heart. So while, while we're all praying, if, if, you, if you prayed that prayer, may I, may I join you in prayer and pray for you? I'd like to ask you, would you just raise your hand if you prayed that prayer? If you prayed it, would you raise your hand and I will pray for you right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Okay, let me pray for you. Father, I just want to identify with my dear friends who are reaching out to you now. And Father, I ask you, please, seal and settle this in their hearts. Give them courage and clarity. And would you confirm to them that you've heard them, that you're for them, that you're going to be with them in a new way from now on. Father, I ask you for encounters with you in prayer. I pray for pro promises from the Bible to spring to life. I pray for clarity when they have to make decisions. I pray for a new ability to hear you when decisions have to be made. I pray for a new jealousy to get it right, a new desire to make sure they're getting it right. Give them, Lord, their heart's desire. Thank you that that is your motivation. That's your motivation. You wanted to make it a wonderful wedding. You want to make our lives wonderful, overflowing. Lord, help us in it. Please bless each of my dear friends whose hands are raised. Lord, I pray for this whole congregation that you'll keep on blessing us. Help us as we go forward as a people that we might make Jesus famous in this whole neighborhood. Our neighbors, our families, our friends. Help us to make Jesus famous. Help us to be those people that can bring people to Jesus when they're in trouble, like Mary did. Lord, help us, Lord. Bless your word to us. Let it bear fruit for your glory, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.